So hello to everybody out there in the ether. Um, we are going to get started in a few minutes. We're gonna give folks who are delayed um, by whatever might be delaying them wherever in the world they may be to get online. So if you'll just stand by with us for a few minutes, like two or three all, is all we'll wait. Um, the good news is this record, this panel discussion will be is being recorded and you'll have an opportunity to look at it down the road. Unfortunately, Jennifer, I'm terribly impatient. Just sitting here waiting is not fun. And I think that now that it's two minutes after the hour, we're gonna get started. Um, First of all, I'd like to say good evening and welcome everyone who is listening and especially to our panelists. Uh, this is the art panel discussion of the All Florida Juried Art Show. My name is Duncan Hurd. My wife and I own the Gilt Complex in downtown Stewart, Gilt, G-I-L-T. We tell people there's no you in Gilt at the Gilt Complex. Uh, we are a custom frame and art restoration business and I also serve on the board of directors of the Martin Arts Foundation. Uh, with me today are Steve Beveridge, Amy Broderick, Julie Feldman, Ethier Joseph, and Anya Muzawel. These, these are all artists who are showing in this show, and we are delighted to have you all with us today. The All Florida Juried Art Show is a 31-year legacy exhibit showcasing recent art by Florida artists and all media. Exhibited works span the mediums of watercolor, ceramics, acrylic, oil, photography, clay, encaustic, wood, metal, glass, and serograph. You can see the show at the Courthouse Cultural Center through November 20th, or virtually at martinarts.org, where you can see it in perpetuity. And I encourage you, if you have not done so yet, you can go to martinarts.org on the homepage. You can click through to learn more about the All Juried Art Show. And near the bottom of that page, there's a link to actually look at the works of art. You can wander through the gallery. You can um, click and get a close up view of each work of art. And there's a little information icon on the side. And there you will find detailed information about the artists, their artist statement about that work of art, and so on. Duncan, I think you are good to start whenever you're ready. I've just been starting. I'm just going to continue, Jennifer. Um, I'd like to give a special shout out to Kirk Key Wang, who is our juror, our juror uh, for this show. He reviewed over 500 entries from about 170 artists, and he selected 64 works of art for this exhibit. Kirk is a professor, professor of visual arts at Ecker College and a board director of the Ringling Museum of Art. He's a painter, sculptor, photographer, and mixed media artist, and in his downtime, he's also an educational software developer, an overachiever. He was born in Shanghai, China, and received his MFA degrees from Nanjing Normal University in China and the University of South Florida. And I'd just like to say this, being a juror of an art exhibit is really hard work. Uh, it's almost impossible to separate the emotional and the personal when reacting to and judging art. Those who have been through the process understand that. Um, and then you add to that the disorienting effect of reviewing everything digitally. 
it's not like he's in a room looking at all the art up close and personal, um, but digitally. And it's all a daunting task. So uh, Kirk is very, very appreciative of the opportunity and I'd like to pass along his thanks. He says, it is my great pleasure to view and appreciate the work submitted for the 31st annual All Florida Juried Exhibition for the Arts Council of Martin County. My congratulations to all the artists who displayed their many talents initiating dialogues via their art, some literal, fictional, non-representational and conceptual. I'm impressed by the overall quality and diversity of works presented here. I apologize in advance, he says, if my judging might be biased and partial. In order for more artists to participate, I chose one work from each artist in this show who I think responded profoundly to the world that we encounter. And I would say that's why the five of you are here. So um, as I explained earlier, what I'd like to do is first, uh, before we get into a general discussion, let's go around the room and we're gonna do this alphabetically and start with you, Steve. Um, so if you would all each introduce yourselves, tell us where you're from, what you do in addition to being an artist, if there is such a thing. Um, and then after that, we're going to look at each of your um, works of art that were chosen for this exhibit. So Steve, you're going to have to unmute yourself. Oh, you are. Steve, we can't hear you. Might be the volume. Jennifer, we need help. He's not muted on my end. Nope. Hear me now? Yes, perfect. Okay, I took my headphones out. I'm so sorry. Don't worry about it. Sorry for the delay. Okay. Um, my name's Steve Beveridge. Thanks for thanks for having me here. Um, I'm, I started to apologize because I'm kind of a an allergic mess. I've already apologized to the panel. So if I'm coughing and sneezing, I've got my my finger close to the mute button. But um, regardless, um, um, I'm the chair of the visual arts department at Pinellas County Center for the Arts, which is um, a magnet program in uh, St. Petersburg, Florida, if St. Petersburg, Florida, where I I've uh, been um, making and teaching art for the past 25 years. I got my um, undergraduate degree from the University of Central Florida, and then um, I received my master's from the University of South Florida in uh, 2000. So just again, happy to be here. Thanks. Thank you. Great. So tell us about the Queen's Gambit. And Jennifer, if you could show that, that would be helpful. So um, this was my first resin pour in probably about 10 years. Um, but I had had a vision for it for probably about a year uh, before I actually um, finished the sculpture. And um, I had started to uh, collect knives. I know that sounds a little bit strange, um, but I had um, been hitting up all of the local uh, second and thrift, secondhand and thrift stores um, in my area. And in total, um, there are there are exactly 395 knives um, inside the sculpture, um, and and I had been and I've been working with the pear form in my art for for many years. So so that's that's not new to my iconography, um, but the chess pieces and and the knives are are relatively new, and and so it's a bit of a progression in my work in, in that regard and the inclusion of those elements. Um, and, and so, yeah, certainly I can, as, as the, uh, the Q and A goes on, I can explain more. So I don't want to take up too much time. No, no, we don't mind you taking up the time, but Jennifer, is there any way for you to enlarge his art? I just see, uh, your screen sharing the full screen of the presentation. Are you able to do that? Okay. Well, it is full screen on my computer. 
So I don't know. No. On my screen, it shows thumbnails of all the works of art from the panelists. Interesting. Here, hold on. The joy is <laughs> modern technology. Yeah. <laughs> a second. 395, Steve? Really? Yes. Yep, 395. I counted all of them out uh, before I did it. I felt like that was going to be, you know, important in some ways to the work and um, even looked up um, the, the the numeric significance of that number and, and found some interesting um, uh, associations with wisdom, um, which I found to be um, relevant in the, in the ways in which uh, the knives, I feel like over time, you know, their usage, wherever they've been in, in their lives, so to speak, um, being functional and purposeful knives acquire a type of wisdom, you know, and that's part of my idea in terms of using found objects and, and thinking about the history of those objects and, and the energy and the psychic energy that they absorb and, and becomes kind of part of the, uh, part of the sculpture, part of the object. So you have three elements. You have the knives, of course, and the chess pieces. Why the two queen chess pieces? So, I mean, I've, I've always been a big fan of, of Marcel Duchamp. And, and if you know anything about the history of his art career, um, after he famously, <laughs> um, you know, basically created the urinal, the um, fountain piece, uh, what, where else are you going to go in your career with that artistically? And he, he basically, he stopped making art and he just pursued chess making for, for the rest of his life, for the rest of his career. And I just found that really admirable. And um, I don't play chess now, but I, but I played a lot in my 20s. And I've always been, I always think about the game. Um, but, I, but when The Queen's Gambit, which was a Netflix original series came out, I just couldn't get enough of it. And I think I binge watched it over like three days. And, um, and, and in seeing that, it just kind of triggered in me um, some thoughts and ideas that were already kind of swirling around with this piece in particular. And some things were really clarified for, for me. And, um, so yeah, I find you know obviously the, the the queen piece is is the most you know powerful piece on the board, and so to put those two pieces, the two queens next to each other, uh, just I'm, I'm hoping that 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 elicits for anybody who knows about chess uh, the, the kind of power figure um, you know that 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 piece exudes. Thank you, that's wonderful. Okay, Amy, we're going to move on to you. Amy Broderick, tell us Hi, about. Everybody. Yeah, hi everyone, I'm Amy Broderick. Uh, so pleased to be in the exhibition and so pleased to be here tonight with all of you. I live here in Jupiter, Florida and I am Associate Professor of Drawing and Painting and Head of the Studio Foundations Program at Florida Atlantic University in Boca Raton. I have been based in Jupiter for more than 20 years but I am originally from Virginia earned my undergraduate degree at the College of William and Mary, and then earned my MFA in painting at the Maryland Institute College of Art before coming to Florida. In addition to working as a full-time university professor and a working artist, I'm also, uh, I have a family, I'm the mom of two sons, and my work both in the show and in general is about noticing the small moments in everyday life and especially taking stock of the quick passage of time. Uh, so much of my work revolves around photographic practice and paper cutting of recycled and abandoned school supplies and office supplies. And my work in the exhibition, Passion of Daedalus, definitely speaks to some of the detailed experiences of being a mid-career bureaucrat. Uh, in addition to all of the joys of being in the studio and being with my students, I also do an enormous number of staff meetings and curriculum developments and state assessments and all that other stuff. And so the intricate, repetitive cutting of holes in office paper uh, for the, the end result of trying to achieve something beautiful is really the underlying objective of the piece in the show. That's wonderful. I have several questions, but I'd like to see the, the work if Jennifer could bring that up.
So Amy, you say you you marry the beautiful and the mundane and the detailed cut. You cut this by hand? I did. I cut that by hand. Uh, the the office supplies themselves are all salvaged from a wonderful establishment, a wonderful organization here in Palm Beach County called Resource Depot. Resource Depot is a nonprofit organization and both an upcycling and an arts organization that really works to provide educators and creators with the raw materials they need to make magical things happen. A lot of K-12 teachers and university faculty in our area get tons of amazing resources there for their students. And I go there often to collect uh, used office supplies. There are a lot of abandoned state government and local government documents or things from law firms or accounting firms. And so this is a stack of uh, three ring binder tab dividers. And all of those eight sided forms are cut by hand. I trace them onto each page from templates. Each one is roughly 5% larger or smaller than the one adjacent to it. And I cut them all out by hand and then I glue everything together. And it is the incremental process of really engaging that haptic energy that it, it refers back to the repetitive processes of bureaucracy or the repetitive nature of grading student papers but at the same time, it speaks to the incredible power and potency of the things we devote our handiwork to and the things we devote our time and attention to. You know, it could be something as mundane as grading a student paper or chopping a carrot, or it could be something as loving as combing a six-year-old's hair. And so the, the things we spend our time on and the things we give our attention to, the things we turn our gaze to and put our fingers on, these are the, the main driving themes in my work. And if you could briefly tell us, how does the passion of Daedalus, da yeah, Daedalus, yeah, well, it's from it's from the myth of Icarus and Daedalus trying to escape from the labyrinth, and uh, Daedalus, of course, was the careful, cautious builder, the one who built the wings, and it and we we know from the story the story of Icarus flying too close to the sun, being too brave and too brazen, and that being his downfall. And Daedalus exists in the myth primarily as a foil to that bravado. But at the same time, I enjoy thinking about the, the passions that Daedalus may indeed have had, the dreams he may indeed have had, and that in fact, doing something unheroic, flying less far from the sun, can in fact be beautiful and productive in its own way. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Julie. Julie Feldman is up next. If you could tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, hi, I'm Julie Feldman. Um, I live in Jacksonville, Florida for the past two and a half years. Before that, we were in Los Angeles for 30 years. And then the last two years in San Francisco. And then we came to Florida because I have family here. My mother grew up here. So I was very involved into teaching in Los Angeles. And um, so trying to get involved here, which I have, I've joined several groups, several arts groups here, and it's very different. So it's been a big period of adjustment, but um, I enter a lot of shows. Um, I still do some teaching um, online for students with disabilities in California. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so- um, Which you can do nowadays. Yeah, definitely. Listen, it was, um, if it hadn't been for Zoom, I don't know what would have happened. They probably would have just gotten someone else, but it's been wonderful. And I'll continue to do that. Um, so I'm a painter. I st I've had a lot of different, I started out um, many years ago. I was originally from Baltimore. Um, I, I spent two years in Paris at school. And then when I came back, I went to the Maryland Institute. Unfortunately, I was there for three years and I never finished, so, <laughs> but I was there. Um, so then um, we moved, when we moved to California, 
I became very involved in weaving. And I had started out with a little tiny loom. Oh, wait, this was way back in Baltimore. I was teaching at a boys prep school in Baltimore. And I was the head of the lower school art department. You might know it, Yeoman School. It was, um, and so I needed things to do with these boys. At the time, it was an all boys school. It's now co-ed. So I thought, well, we'll try weaving. So we got all the small looms and everything, and the boys loved it, and I loved it. So I started weaving, and I moved on to a very, very large floor loom and started doing installations, mainly for commercial interiors and apartment buildings and things. And then after that, um, we did move to California, and I was still weaving. But then I got involved in um, with a partner. We had a textile business where we hand painted textiles, and they were sold as pillows and floor cloths, and we sold them mainly to designers. So we had a studio. And in between this, I had been traveling and had seen this woman who's French, who is considered like the doyen of dried botanicals. And I can't remember her name right now. Anyway, my husband said, this looks like your work. And it did have, I remember, I can still remember the beautiful shop window. And it was so much texture. It was different than wool and yarn. It was all these magnificent grasses and dried flowers and just, just an incredible sight. So I came back to Los Angeles and I started a business doing dried botanicals. And I did that for about 12 years. And then um, we lost our son. And so I stopped doing that because I, 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 I was dealing with, you know, all the prima donnas in Los Angeles. And I thought, I can't do this anymore. So I started painting. And so that was in 2015. And um, I've really been very, very serious about it and have um, taken courses, um, have taught some courses, entered lots of shows. And um, I can't tell you how, I mean, I was just incredibly thrilled to win the first place in this show. I couldn't believe it. Let, so, me, uh, let me interrupt there and ask Jennifer to bring up your entry. And I neglected to say that Amy won honorable mention. And as you just said, um, Julie, yours won first place. So describe the piece for us the uh, thought process that went into it and so on. Okay, this it's a large piece. It's um, 30 inches high by 40 inch, 48 inches long. And it is, um, I use oil, I use water-based oils um, because I have a small studio. And so I thought I can't, you know, I, it's much safer. There's no odor and the cleanup's easier and everything. So this piece was done in November of 2020. And I get um, a lot of my images, I'm inspired by personal photographs or found imagery. And this was from a photograph that was in the New York Times Magazine section. And it was all these shots of people in Manhattan, most of them walking, you know, just a few people. And this was one, This it, it just struck me completely. This woman was looking back and she was all bundled up. She had on a hat and scarves and everything else. And I just started thinking, I mean, it was just so inspiring to me. It's probably one of the fastest paintings I ever did because usually I take a while when I'm painting. And I think I probably finished it in maybe two days. It was just so spontaneous. And it was, it just struck me that it was um, so emblematic of what was going on at the time. And I was wondering, was she looking around because she was scared? or she thought she saw somebody she knew or she wanted to be sure people weren't walking too close to her. Um, so that was, and then I put this in a solo show that I had here in December. And um, I got so many wonderful comments. It was, well, the whole show was called Behind <clears throat> their, their Eyes because most of my work does really dwell on the eyes of the subject. Mm -hmm. So. Great. Thank you. Um, no, thank you. And I'm sure we'll return to it. Uh, but I want to I do want to get a chance for everyone to get in here. Um, next up is Ethia. Tell us tell us a bit about yourself and about your entry. Hi, everyone. Again, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Ethia Joseph. Uh, a little bit about me prior to uh, painting. 
uh, well, actually, I recently moved from New York to uh, to uh, Florida. While in New York, I uh, I have uh, as far as my education, I have a, a bachelor's in photography and media, and I have a master's in business education. Uh, prior to painting, uh, for about a good five or six years, I was doing photography, uh, which which I, I, I still love. You know, but uh, I reached a point in photography, I wanted more control. Uh, I felt like uh, it wasn't enough for me. I wasn't satisfied. Uh, the things that I, I saw, uh, the people I, uh, like I see, I, I just could not create that uh, with photography. So then uh, I, I, I went back to uh to uh I, I also have an associates in, in in photography while there i had taken about two or three uh painting classes which i fell in love with painting back then but uh i'm mostly a self-taught uh, painter besides those two or three classes that i had uh, i've never had any other uh, training in painting but I've always loved art and I have so many uh, artists that I admire. So basically I just went and, 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 and st start painting and, and, and start creating uh, w w things I see my way, you know? And, and then from there, my paintings have been evolving. I experiment with, uh, with, uh, with oil with uh, acrylic, uh, I, I introduced plaster into my paintings. Uh, I, uh, I stretch my own canvas, I make my own frames. Uh, I just want, uh, there's just so much I feel like I need to say. Uh, that's the only way I can, I can do it, is start with just a rolled up canvas and then go from there. Uh, all my paintings, uh, it's just me communicating to the viewers how I see life. I have, a, I have this passion for life. Uh, I have a passion for people. Uh, I love to read about uh, uh, outer space. Stephen Hawking uh, is one of my favorite uh, people. That I, I I used to love to read his books. Sometimes I you know I wonder you know do we uh, are we in parallel universe? Oops, we lost you. Uh, Ethan, <laughs> you can't hear me. Just wanna just uh, go go crazy with it all. Okay, uh, Jennifer, well, let's bring up his piece, his artwork for the exhibit, and the title is "I Am." This is slightly different than what was submitted. I assume this was when. Uh, it was a work in progress. Well, with all honesty, uh, I did not want to exceed the, the size restriction that uh, that I saw, uh, because uh, it, 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 when I submitted this, it was rolled up. It, uh, it wasn't framed at all. And then when I was reading the uh, the requirement, and so I, so then I, I basically just uh, modify it. To, to make it fit the requirement because I did not want it to get rejected because it was a it, it was too big. But in theory, though, it, it wasn't really that much uh, that was uh, taken away. But uh, basically, I am. Uh, it's basically a a human triumph. You know, uh, all of us have an I am story. Uh, uh, you know, it's us being being powerful, amazing, and uh, as you can see, uh, I I introduced plaster because I would I wanted the main subject to rise above the canvas, and and uh, I figured if I start using oil, uh, one it would just take too long for for me to get the height that I wanted. I figured the best way to do it is basically use plaster. Also with plaster, what I love is that, uh, of course, if the mixture is not right, you will have uh, a, a bit of crackling in the crackling. It's us, you know, even though we are powerful, we're also very, very fragile. So, so, so in, in some instances, you will see a little bit crackling uh, in the, uh, in the plaster just to show you know we are uh, emotional creatures too so yeah i wanted to showcase that it's a wonderful piece thank you very creative and i'm glad you made it work um the uh 
what you, I guess you redid it and it's very close, very close to this, what you see, especially the main figure in the orangey red on the left Thank side. Thank you. Anya, you're up. Unmute yourself though. <laughs> I forgot that. So sorry about that. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Anna Mosolo. Oh, I apologize. My kids are in the background and oh, I have no. two dogs and yeah, I'm the only grown up at home right now. So, um, so yeah. sorry. So I'm very happy to be here and it was really thrilled to be part of this show. Um, I live in Miami, Florida. Of course, it was pure silence when everybody else was talking and then now it's my turn and everything starts um so anyhow i'm from miami florida i was born and raised here and i uh, did my bachelor's degree in photography at barry university that's in miami shores and then um i was um, a high school teacher for a few years uh for about three years in hialeah florida and uh, i decided i wanted to go back and do my master's degree. And I did just that. Uh, and I went to the School of Visual Arts in Manhattan and did my uh, MFA in photography and video. And then I moved back to Miami and I've been a high school uh, photography teacher for the last 10 years at the same school. Um, and when I was in, uh, well, graduate school, I started kind of gravitating towards this theme of uh, family and, and loss. I had been going through a lot of um, kind of uh, personal family things and there were some sick relatives, some that had passed on. So uh, naturally my, my work went towards that theme because that was what I was living and feeling at the moment. And I kind of just kept going with that. And that's uh, when I started doing video. Uh, so the video work, uh, kind of informed everything else that I did after that because it had to do with, you know, family recipes and cooking and things like that. So I was filming in my grandmother's homes and things that they would prepare that stuff, you know, foods that we no longer take the time to, to do anymore because we're too busy or, you know, we've kind of lost that vernacular. But then, uh, you know, from there, I, I went on to, to document my... Um, my mom's side of the family, which is Cuban. And that's a kind of a big uh, part of my work too, because I'm half Cuban and half Lebanese. So I documented my mom's side and kind of the everyday ordinary things that would go on in their homes um, with my grandparents. And uh, it was just one of those houses where a lot of people just would come and go visitors and family members they would just all land at their house um Anya, and then Anya, yes. at this point Je uh, jennifer bring up her her um entry because it speaks directly to what she's talking about now and this Thank is called you. grandmothers correct great grandmothers correct so um you know i had two i had two children at some point so uh, it took me a while to, to really get back into making work. And then the pandemic happened and I took this one singular picture of my, my grandmother. It, that happens to be her living room right there. Um, and then I continued to take pictures um, after my, uh, my grandfather had passed away. Um, yep. No, sorry. Well, the uh, the model wants to say hi. Hi. She can't help it. Um. So, uh, then it became about something else because my you know I watched I, this picture I took of my grandmother in her living room. You know, kind of navigating her everyday life during the pandemic and and mourning my grandfather. And then it you know. I started photographing in their house again, but it wasn't the same. So I realized that I was photographing my daughter, the, the girl in the picture a lot and my grandmother. And then I said, I'm gonna also start photographing myself and my mom. And then it evolved into this project that became about um, 
these complex relationships between mother and daughter. So, um, and, you know, grandmother and uh, granddaughter, great grandmother, and that kind of thing. So, um, so you see my daughter here, she gave me this little gift because she, uh, she helps me a lot with the pictures. Um, not always, but on this day, it was like one picture and that was that was it. Uh, she gave me this gift and my, my son happened to be walking by um, holding a stack of train, toy trains in his hand. Um, it's wonderful. But I'm still, <laughs> thank you. What I love so, about, what I love about your photograph is it's a photograph, document, there are photographs everywhere in the composition. And I'm sure that was intentional. Yes, yes. Um, I went back and I definitely wanted to get a table full of pictures and uh, my grandmother displayed baby Jesus on her coffee table all year round. So I didn't display the whole thing, but just part of the arm and the leg showing up there. And of course the wall of pictures that come out uh, in the background as well. Um, but she, she didn't, um, I didn't tell her how to pose or anything. She just, you know, sat there and, you know, just looked at me and she was probably thinking, how long is she going to take this time? Um, <laughs> um, but no, she, she really, she really was a trooper. Um, and I, I think the, you know, as I, develop the the project and the more I think about it and write about it um I, I think it is that kind of mother-daughter relationship between me and her and at the same time I have the images of my grandmother and my mom who have you know a totally different mother-daughter relationship the, the roles are reversing right so the you know the caregiver is now my you know her daughter right yeah. and and, and I'm just uh, seeing where this goes because I, I, it's pretty new. It's a pretty new project for me. It only just started last year. Well, thank you. It's, it's, I, I find it fascinating personally. Um, what I like thank to do you. now is get into a general conversation. And I've, I've got to say that in the last couple of years with everything that we have all been through and with the pandemic and working from home or not working or whatever the case may be and that even with what we're experiencing here we're not in an auditorium on a stage with an audience we're behind cameras so our world has changed and even Kirk in his comments um, in his statement was talking about how difficult it is to judge art using an image as opposed to looking at the actual piece of art. So my question to all of you is, how has technology altered your approach to your art? Or is it changing your approach to art? Anya, I assume, yeah, I mean, you live technology in, with photography, so that might be easy, but it, whoever wants to speak up and, and comment, I'm, I'm very curious the extent to which uh, digital technology informs your artistic expression. I've had Julie. to become a photographer, which I never had to do before. Um, it really did change everything in the, the frustrating hours that I've spent trying to photograph a piece with the right DPIs and high resolution and everything else has been incredibly frustrating, but I think I finally come close. But it was much better when you could just take your paintings to a gallery or to a show and they pick them out. Yeah. Anyone else? I, um, I started out as a, as a film photographer. So, you know, it took me a while. I was a bit stubborn about letting that uh, part of me go because it was getting harder and harder to develop the film. And, um, and just there's nowhere uh, even in town anymore that develops film. I have to send it out. Um, so I 
inevitably switched to digital by the time I was in graduate school. And, you know, I still was never happy with it. I, I um, recently, uh, finally, at last, decided to go with digital but medium format. And that has helped me a lot um, as far as, you know, the, the quality and uh, the details of the pictures as well, because it, it mimics what I used to do with film photography in the past. Do any of you others who are into the uh, the at the same time the the and you quoted Kirk having said this the way we respond profoundly to the world that we encounter on the one hand technology has changed everything and look at this magical event that it is making possible for all of us to be together in this space right now but at the same time so many of the driving forces are are permanent they're fundamental the way mothers love their children, the way working people balance work and life. I mean, I am forever being interrupted by my own kids or being helped by my own kids. And they have a way even of sitting when my camera is out, uh, like, oh, is mom, is mom in that mode? And so the way, even as the technologies change, the way we look, the way we compose, the way we select, the way we as artists direct others' attention to certain moments in the world. I find that it makes us even more powerful, our ability to direct people's attention in an environment where there are so many more options than there used to be for the things that we pay attention to. Right. Anyone else? Yeah, well, sure. Uh, I'll uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Steve. Go ahead. Uh, I'm just going to say, yeah, very, very well said, Amy. I'm just glad I'm not taking 35 millimeter slides anymore to uh, to document <laughs> my, my artworks and that I can, you know, work digitally. And I don't even have to have a, I mean, I can do, I, I, I know I did take that, the photos that I submitted for the show for my sculpture, I did take with it with a nice um, Canon SLR. Uh, but I probably could have taken them with my with my iPhone, you know, and they probably could have come out just as well. But uh, to be able to use the internet to to research and and um, and the immediacy, the our access to uh, resources um, that we have not right now that that we can, you know, um, Ethiard, you know, you, you mentioned uh, Stephen Hawking, you know, and 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 the ability to not even have to read his books, but to, but to listen to an audio book about him, you know, on my on my drive to work. Um, there's a lot of other things that about technology that cer certainly influence our thinking and, and our ways of, of making art are, are therefore changed um, in, in ways that, that make us more efficient, um, that, as you mentioned, Amy, that make us more powerful, make us more potent in our expressions. And um, so it's, it's dangerous, I think, sometimes to think about uh, not opening a book, you know, but I think we have to kind of embrace what sorts of positive consequences come out of the new technologies that are available to us. Um, Amy, I was interested in like your, you know, you hand cut these things, but you could have turned to like, say, um, like a laser router or something like that for, for technology to do that. But I, but I do feel like I, I respect that craft um, and that hand, you know, hand touched element. So <clears throat> beautiful piece. Okay. Oh, thank you. No, uh, I can relate to to uh, so many of you. Uh, in uh, I had mentioned before my undergrad, and, uh, my bachelor's, and my associates are in photography. So I have used film, uh, but there's one realm that I haven't touched yet. Believe it or not, uh, for the past ten years, I have an almost brand new eight by ten film camera. So eventually it's wrapped up somewhere. Eventually I do want to use it because uh, one, it'll be such a new learning curve for me. Uh, the only time I had used an eight by 10 camera, but it, it was in college, but then we had a, di a digital back to it. So we didn't actually process it the old fashioned way. So eventually I do want to use that. But now how I use technology uh, with my paintings, uh, Every painting I I, uh, I create, I, I document this. Sometimes I use time lapse, and and, and eventually I, I want to basically have you know like a, like a good two hour uh, you know mini documentary is basically about uh, about my paintings. In addition, it took me a while to uh, to, to get on social media because I just for a while 
I was painting mostly for myself. I didn't really uh, want to show it uh, to people, you know, like of uh, like you know, uh, um, my mother-in-law and you feel people say, you know what? Hey, you should start showing your work. It's good, show it. So, but for years I didn't really show my work. So now my phone, I I record time lapse on my phone. When I'm done, I, I do a full edit on my phone, and then I just post it on on Instagram or, or Facebook. Where, with all honesty, I do have a very nice quality Canon uh, camcorder in a bag. It would take me so much longer to charge the big battery, plug it in, import to Photoshop. With all honesty, my phone does it probably 85% that good, and I do it in a minute instead of, let's say, 45 minutes. So, so I agree with you guys. Technology definitely has, uh, has increased my, uh, uh, my productivity, which in a way, you know what? I'm kind of thankful. <laughs> you know, I don't have to open Photoshop every time I need to do <laughs> an edit. Not that I hate Photoshop, I love Photoshop. Um, going in a different direction, one thing I'm struck by is how different your art is, each of you from the other. It's just, it, it, it would have been very easy to get two oil painters, three oil painters or whatever, but everyone, the photography, uh, sculpture, uh, Amy with, I would guess it'd be mixed media, uh, and so forth. And I'm taken by Ethid's comment in his statement, he paints because he must. I paint because I must. And I have to think that is true from, for every artist everywhere, no matter what their creative endeavor might be. So my question to you is, if you paint because you must, or you photograph because you must, or you create because you must, what do you hope those who are viewing your art will walk away from, from it with? What, what do you hope they would feel after viewing your art? I can, I can start. Uh... I always leave stuff out because I, I always feel that my paintings are never complete. Each viewer can add their own two cents to it. And, and, and to me, you know, uh, that's the power of art, you know. Uh, my shapes uh, could resemble a few things. Uh, I, you know, I love to use colors, uh, you know, to suck you in, where for those, oh, uh, in, especially that's why I usually. <laughs> Here we go again. Is it just me? Mm -hmm. I think we can't hear you. I lost him. So we can't hear you. Sorry. You no, know, this is it. You know, there there is nothing else. And 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 then when you leave, you're like, well, I saw this. Like, what did he mean by that? I wonder if that's what he was thinking. So so on your so when you leave, you're still wondering. And to me, to me, uh, it, and. I feel we live in a world that uh, that could be uh... Ethier, you're leaving out the best parts. <laughs> <laughs> He'll jump back in if I passed his prelude. Ethier, we can't hear you. No, it's not your fault. It's probably your internet connection. Oh, sorry, I lost you guys there for a while, huh? That's all right. Are you wrapped up? Yes. All right. Who else wants to jump in? What What do you hope people feel when they view your art? Can Can I speak? Um, so the, the title of my piece is is the Queen's Gambit, and and so in your question, I started thinking about risk, because the gambit is is actually a risk, and it's a it's a chess move made by the pawn in an attempt to essentially feign vulnerability, um, but, but essentially bait your opponent into making a move which would then give you the upper hand. And so, you know, chess play in general is a, it's a, it's a great metaphor for life and, and in particular with, um, with relationships. Um, and so a lot of my work recently has been inspired by personal relationships, intimate relationships that I've been in that have not been so healthy 
um, we can sometimes be pulled into um, relationships where the um, uh, the way in which we interact becomes about gaining the upper hand and um, in the moves we make and and um, and so you know in, in choosing a, a a pair in and having this kind of vulnerability this kind of fruit you know which is is weak and and susceptible to decay and then imbuing it with the strength of 395 knives that kind of like lurk underneath the surface unbeknownst to the opponent you know mm -hmm. almost like a threat a danger a, a potential for for poisoning um was sort of behind that that idea um but but i guess it, it it's really about risk it's it's about um how we conduct ourselves how we respond to the ways in which other people um treat us or behave and and can we be pulled into those things can we set boundaries um you know in chess play it's it's ultimately a puzzle that you're both figuring out together it could it could be seen as a game but like people who played enough chess understand that it that it really is kind of a, 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 a an end game which is a puzzle leading to an outcome in which one person is deemed loser and the other person is deemed winner um, but, but nobody wins in chess ultimately <laughs> because of the way you play chess, because it by its very nature is, is deceptive and cunning and, um, and that's not good for relationships. And, and, um, so yeah, anyway, that's great. Thank you, Amy. Yeah, I would, I would offer circling back, Duncan, to your initial remark about how diverse our work is. It's a real testament to Kirk's open-mindedness in jurying all of our work in. And I think it's also one of the gifts of being a creative worker in the 21st century. And I wanted to say this in particular because I see one of my graduate students among the participants and the, the idea of not needing to be pigeonholed in any one specific studio practice, being able to combine all of it is a real gift. But also even looking at some of our Facebook viewers, like there is meaning all over the place and there is the potential for meaning everywhere and there is important work everywhere. There are so many things that we do as humans that if we decide that we want to do those things well, with a certain amount of pride and care and attention than whether we are making a painting or cooking a meal or soothing a colicky baby. Like these are the things that make the world a better place and that make that world a, make the world a beautiful place. Julie, Anya. Yeah, I mean, it, in my work, since it's, you know, about my family and uh, it tends to be more personal, I, you know, hope people can somehow find a way to relate to their own memories because it's part of it for me. Um, so, you know, how people translate the or interpret my work, hopefully will come from a personal place of their own. Um, because of the nature of the work, right? Um, so, yeah, I think I think that's pretty much um, what I'm thinking. And, and and in my past work, it it was something a little bit more uh, a little bit more visceral because it was it involved like food and that kind of thing. But this is more of a portrait um, project. Um, and I think especially, you know, the ones of my daughter and, and, and the one in the show um, show that that little bit of emotion. Sorry, she's a little under the weather in the background. That's but, how we um, but yeah, the emotional connection and, and connection to your own memories is what I hope people uh, get out of my work. Thank you. Julie, and do you I have kind of, I kind of feel the same way about my work that people some of some of my work is more personal than others because it's from I've used personal photographs and so then I do know the narrative much more when I've used when I use found imagery similar like the painting that's here um, I'm creating the narrative really as I paint and I'm hoping well from responses I've gotten from people they say it's you know there's there's so much emotion um, and they 
the ending is their own their own meaning. They're going to walk away and say, you know, well, how does that appeal to me? You know, how does that affect me? What emotion is going on there? Um, who is she looking at, or what is she looking at? So for me, it's it's pretty much the same way. It's very personal, and I hope people walk away not having a clear answer of anything. Very nice. Okay, last question. Um, I like to think, Amy mentioned this, that creativity is everywhere. And you can be inspired by anything. You all approach your work and your art differently. So, and we all run into ruts once in a while. Um, Anya mentioned that she was working artistically, then went back to school, and then was having a little trouble getting restarted. So my question to you is, when you need a creative kick in the butt, when you need a spark, what do you do to inspire your creativity? Don't all talk at once. <laughs> I'll, I'll usually, if I'm, if I'm having a long term um, where I really need a big kick, I'll try to go to a bunch of galleries and museums. Um, personally, in my studio, if I'm just feeling really stuck, I'll usually turn on Amy Winehouse. <laughs> that gets me going. <laughs> um, and I've also found sometimes if I force myself to go into my studio early in the morning, that's usually just not the best time. I found that usually between two and seven is when I really am at my creative peak. Two and seven two, afternoon? Like two in the afternoon. Okay. Thank goodness I have a husband who cooks. So <laughs> <laughs> when he's ready for dinner, then I stop. I'm into that. Who else? Um, I'll go. Uh, I think that sometimes if, if I've been in a rut in the past, I'm not doing work, um, can't seem to get my direction, you know, where to go. Um, I just, just make the work, even if it's terrible, because something, anything will come out of it, something good, right? Um, and hopefully a better idea will come along and, and just Looking at other work, like Julie said, and um, attending artists' workshops and classes is also super helpful for me. Um, so I, I went to the Anderson Ranch over the summer and got away from my kids for a week and just focused on, you know, doing work for a whole five days and it was spectacular. So it was very motivating. So things like that have to be done sometimes, especially if, um, you know, there's a lot of distractions at home or simply you just need to clear the air, you know, and cobwebs out of your, you know, your mind a little bit. Thank you. Next. I don't think we're ever too old to look to other artists for inspiration. I mean, I, I feel like coming away from this whole conversation, I, I can take, I can sample a bit of each of your work and, and be inspired by it in some way. And I don't know how that would manifest in my own work, um, but I think that's a really healthy thing to do. I mean, as a teacher, teaching young artists, emerging artists, um, to encourage them to have art models um, that they can consistently go to. Um, uh, I discovered, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the artist Samuel Bach, um, uh, several years ago. Um, he's, he's Israeli born. He's, he, the man's in his 80s now. Uh, but um, he, he creates these surreal landscapes where the still life objects, which include pears and, 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 and chess pieces and other objects, and, and investing them with the kind of psychic energy and, and the kind of like um, uh, on the subconscious level. Um, they're just beautiful to look at. And I go back to him occasionally to kind of, uh, you know, reconsider what I'm doing in my own work. And, and he's a painter, I'm a sculptor. Um, so, so I like the kind of just kind of um, just enough distance and space there. Um, but nature and science, ETR, it sounds like science is an inspiration to you that continues to inspire me, you know, hearing 
um, you know, things, new, new ideas about the universe and quantum physics and uh, those things. So, um, yeah, you got We've got to practice what we preach. If you're a teacher and you're telling your, your art students, you can't wait for inspiration to just come, come to you. You have to go out and find, find out what, what those things are and, um, and, and, uh, and make that a part of your regular practice. Thank you. Ethier and Amy, anything to add? Uh, I'll go if Amy's not going to go. I mean, I agree with, uh, with, uh, Steve and also uh, Anya. Uh, I mean, I look, uh, I look at everything, uh, nature. Uh, I'll, you know what? I, I like to go for a, a lot of times in the past. I'll find inspiration in the places I would never thought possible. Uh, you know, which which. We're gonna wait them out. Poor guy. Invariably, this is the most profound thing he's saying. I don't, I, I, I don't read about the person. I don't read the comment because I don't want to steal. I, I, I just want to get this massive influx of just knowledge. I don't want to know where it's from, who it's from. Then I feel like, well, I'm not stealing. I'll, I'll just flip the page, flip the page, go, to, uh, go from every book, uh, MC Escher. Uh, uh, is uh, is one of my one of my all time favorites. You know, mathematician turn, uh, turn um, uh, artist. So I'll just go to a library, and sometimes you know, uh, there's a book that I found that was so remarkable. It was a book of signs from like all around the world. I w I would just uh, look at it, and what really I'll be very quick with this. What 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 amazed me was how so many cultures would just basically use the same sign and just change it a little bit, change it a little bit, make it evolve. So long story short, I get inspired by everybody, everything. I just suck it all in. Thank you. <laughs> Andy, anything to add? I've been enjoying everybody else's strategies. I love that. But uh, I would say that I'm, 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 I'm never out of ideas. I never have trouble having ideas. And it's just like, I go through phases when all my ideas are terrible, but I'm not afraid of bad ideas. And this is one of the things I started out with my students. And then I ultimately had to take my own advice. Like in art making, there are no bad options. Like just make it, make some dogs, make some work that fails, make some stuff that's garbage. Like no, no lives will be lost. You just get up the next day and you do it all over again. And that's one of the real treasures of just not being afraid just to fail real badly a lot. And, uh, and once you kind of overcome that fear, the, anything is possible. Isn't that true of all artists? You have to be willing to fail. I mean, you have to, because you're experimenting all the time. Um, well, thank you all. I, I don't want to end it just yet because I want to give anyone who's watching, we have about 10,000 people on Facebook and another 500 on our Zoom webinar, and I made those numbers up. <laughs> um, if you have a question for the panel in general or anyone in particular, um, uh, we invite you at this time to go to your chat box on your computer and type it in and I will read it off and we'll go from there. Uh, in the meantime, see no one's jumping on. I don't, I think my 10,000 was a little high. What do you think? <laughs> yeah. can, I, can I just say, as, as we're waiting, can I say yeah. something to Anya? You know, one of my favorite moments in this, in this time together this evening was with you and your art and, and just the things that were happening around you in your space with you know, your child and that we were looking at a picture of your child and just just really beautiful, like what you're involved in right now artistically um, and how your photo is just really beautiful. Like I can't, I, I kept looking at it and it's like a visual game of Clue, you know, like there's, there's so many levels on it, you know, and the baby Jesus's knee coming up at just the same angle as your daughter's knee, which made me want to go look to the photographs and just find other details. I just think it's a really, really important piece. Um, that back table, there's nothing on it, but there's so much on the front table. There's just so many curiosities to that photo. So I think you really did a special piece there. 
Thank you so much. And thank you all for your patience. I, I, I'm telling you, everything was quiet until the moment I had to speak. And then I had somebody poking me or running through the room and making the dogs bark. Okay, there they go again. Exactly. It's because they heard you speak and they're like, oh, I need attention from mom now. Yeah, what I suspect happened is Steve sent his aura to you because this he started sneezing and hacking and coughing and through the entire discussion he's been perfectly fine <laughs> <laughs> i'm a great actor yeah. oh, wow. um i don't see any questions coming up from our inf oh infinite um no i do have one from nancy what and this is a general panel uh, question what would you have to say to a young person who's considering being a professional artist? What advice would you give them? I, I'm not big on advice, but uh, I'm, I'm gonna look at this from my own perspective. Uh, just justify your why because to me for a while i i was toying with the idea i was wondering and then i it took me a while to finally commit to it and when i realized my why it doesn't matter in the beginning uh and that's the reason why i kind of kept it personal for uh, for so many years because i wasn't comfortable with showing it to the world so if you can find your why you want to create this then to me you are halfway there <laughs> anya maybe your daughter wants to comment <laughs> <laughs> she will have lots to say but i, I have to say if there had hit the the nail on the head right there I, I was thinking the same thing you have to uh know your your why and i think also, you just have to, you know, forget about inspiration. You know, like Chuck Close said, inspiration is for amateurs. You just gotta, you know, do it, you know. And, and we've all had those moments where we're in a funk and can't, um, you know, produce some work that we are, you know, that we like and everything, but it, um, sorry, <laughs> he's performing for us now. Um, I even forgot what I was gonna say. Sorry. That's all right. Anybody else want to pipe in about advice you might give a young person considering being a professional artist? Uh, I, I mean, it, you, I, could, I would replace that the young person with a young artist considering to be a professional artist. Um, it, it, at what point do we decide to pursue art? It matters. And, and how far we, we endeavor that, uh, that path. Um, you certainly don't want to do it for the money, as you know, as we all know, you, you're, you're, you know, you, there's, there's a, a very small percentage of people who actually make it um, in, in, in terms of um, becoming an art star, making it into the art history books. You wouldn't want to do it for that purpose, uh, but, it, but it satisfies a need. I mean, Joseph Boys um, famously uh, uh, promoted the idea that, that we're all artists, um, that we're all we're made to be creative. We all have that potential. And, and in today's art world, there's so many different avenues to pursue. Um, the traditional drawing, sculpture, painting um, are, not, are not the limited means of expression. And, and so people are expressing themselves in ways that are, uh, and, and, and as you mentioned, Duncan, with technology, um, we're gonna see art change in the next 100 years, 200 years to be, I think, something completely different than, than we recognize it today. And um, it'll be interesting to see how the art history books will, will cover that and who the famous artists are today that will become less relevant uh, because of the, the changes that occur. <clears throat> Anyone else? Amy? I love everything that y'all just said. I think it's all right on the money for artists of every age, because it's one thing to get started and another thing to stick with it. And just on a tactical level, I would say to everyone, like build, build your team, build your team around you. All the 
people in your life who love you, let them know that you're doing this and let them know why you do it and, and let them know their importance in your success. Like I'm looking and I mean, my parents are watching this on Facebook right now. And, you know, a, a friend of mine who used to be one of our babysitters and who has now created a life for herself, like, and all of these people are watching this event because they're part of my team. And so to let all the people around you know the role they play and that they are important, that is just a huge help. I think sometimes as artists, we think we've got to go it alone and be misunderstood. And I think that that's not the way to go. The only thing I would add is don't ever stop. Don't ever stop. I, I was taken by Julie's introduction when she talked about all the various things you've been doing throughout the course of your life. And every last one of them was creative, creative driven by your creativity. And so that's, that's my thought, don't ever stop. Um, if you I, I have been creating since I was just a little girl. I still remember my first art class was at the Baltimore Museum of Art and I was four years old <laughs> and I never stopped. So, and with Amy, what you said is so true. You know, you have to have that team around you. I mean, supporting you and saying, go for it, do it. You know, and I've, I've been lucky to have that with my parents, my son, my husband. So that's very important. And with that, I think we'll, we'll end it. Um, I know Anya has, potentially has children to feed. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest of us have to eat. So um, I, I, I can't thank you all enough. Uh, We've had Stephen Beveridge, Amy Broderick, Julie Feldman, Ethier Joseph, and Anya Maswell all um, exhibiting in the uh, All Florida Juried Art Show, the 31st edition of it. I'd also like to thank Nancy Turrell and Jennifer Hearn and Elise Rafa and everyone else at Martin Arts for all that they do uh, in putting together this program, but everything they do throughout the year. It's quite astounding. I would tell the thousands who are watching right now that if you like what you've experienced this evening and want a little more of it, go to martinarts.org and you can learn about upcoming exhibits and events. Uh, you'll also find a, a very handy dandy donate button there if you are so moved to support the mission of Martin Arts. Uh, my name's Duncan Hurd and I'd like to bid you all good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye, you, everybody. Great to meet all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night.